In August of 1983, a game developed by Michael Toy, Ken Arnold, and Glenn Wickman was included in version 4.2 of UC Berkeley's Unix, commonly known as BSD. BSD was used on college campuses all across the world, and suddenly this little game found itself on college computers everywhere. This game, known as Rogue, would go on to unalterably shift the course of gaming history. Rogue would inspire a whole genre of games known as roguelikes, so named because they take inspiration from Rogue's design. However, there is a lot of debate around what exactly being like Rogue means. The question of what a roguelike is has spawned much debate in roguelike circles, and today I would like to throw my hat into this ring for a few reasons. Firstly, I would like to explain what a roguelike is for those who might be unfamiliar with the genre. However, I would also like to respond to some of the definitions proposed by roguelike veterans, and why I find some of these definitions lacking. If you were to ask me, I would argue that roguelikes are characterized by two essential characteristics, those being procedural generation and permadeath. Let's start by discussing procedural generation. A roguelike must feature levels or encounters that utilize procedural generation. For the purposes of this definition, procedural level generation describes a set of systems that follow a set of methods that utilize randomness to produce levels or encounters. In other words, procedural generation produces random levels that are constrained by the implementation of rules that guide the randomness of the generation. Developers of procedurally generated levels focus on algorithmic processes that produce levels according to very specific rule sets. There is a very good reason why roguelikes opt for the more algorithmic approach. When Rogue's original developers began to work on the game, they wanted to address a specific problem. In 1980, when the game was first released, text-based adventure games were common on the computers available to Rogue's developers. While these games could be compelling for a while, eventually a player would exhaust every possible narrative path, which made these games significantly less replayable. In response to these canned adventures, the developers implemented a system that procedurally generated dungeon layouts, monster spawns, and even the effects of potions and scrolls. Rogue's use of procedural generation had some very important effects on its gameplay, and those effects rippled into the future as other games iterated on the foundation that Rogue provided. When done well, the infinite supply of novel levels can lead to an experience that is extremely replayable. When done poorly, you end up with what procedural generation expert Kate Compton refers to as the 10,000 bowls of oatmeal problem. The 10,000 bowls of oatmeal problem has everything to do with the limits of human perception. As Compton describes, I can easily generate 10,000 bowls of plain oatmeal, with each oat being in a different position and different orientation, and mathematically speaking, they will all be completely unique. But the user will likely just see a lot of oatmeal. In the context of roguelike level design, a game that lacks perceptual uniqueness in its level generation will produce levels that become stale and played out over repeat playthroughs. The discussion about what leads to compelling procedural generation is incredibly interesting, but it falls outside of the scope of this video, which is focused on defining what procedural generation is. However, in the future I might make a video diving more into what makes for effective procedural generation. There are some other very important effects of procedural generation. In games with static level design, players are able to optimize their play by memorizing level layouts, which could get repetitive if the player is forced to play through the same segments repeatedly to achieve success. Procedural generation shifts the focus of play away from memorization and towards a more improvisational play. Players can encounter the game's elements in countless remixed ways, so when approaching obstacles, roguelike players have to consider the equipment that they have acquired in the random dungeon, the structure of the playspace, the enemies the player is fighting, and countless other factors. And in the best roguelikes, repeat scenarios will be very rare. Instead of encouraging players to focus on memorizing and mastering specific level layouts, roguelikes encourage players to focus on memorizing and mastering a game's systems. Procedural generation is incredibly important to the design and personality of roguelikes. However, I did want to address some of the edge cases to clarify what is and is not considered procedural level generation. 
Some games take a very controlled approach to procedural generation, to the point where they have pre-built level bases that random elements are layered on top of. The Risk of Rain games, for instance, have pre-built levels, and the only thing differentiating one instance of a level from another are the locations of the teleporter and item boxes. Even beyond this most extreme example, many roguelikes use room templates that are populated with random enemies. If not done extremely carefully, I feel the results of this style of procedural generation can feel quite oatmeal-y. However, each generated level is technically mathematically distinct. These slight mechanical differences are driven by random processes, and each iteration is technically different from the others, so I feel that slight alterations to a base can count as procedural generation. Some roguelikes are quite unusual in the sense that they focus less on traversing a series of interconnected levels and more on surviving a series of distinct encounters, which may or may not be procedurally generated. In this sort of game, players bounce back and forth between a more zoomed out world map that lets them choose their next mission, and a more zoomed in gameplay style that lets the player resolve the conflict that they choose. Faster Than Light, abbreviated to FTL, is notable for innovating this style of roguelike. In FTL, players hop from star system to star system, experiencing random encounters as they attempt to outrun the rebel fleet. Interestingly, for the most part, FTL's encounters aren't even procedurally generated, but are instead pulled randomly from a list of pre-built encounters. Some later encounter-based roguelikes would decide to procedurally generate their encounters, while others would stick to the pre-built style used by FTL. While not all of these games used procedurally generated encounters, they do utilize procedural generation to randomize the layout of these encounters and the order in which these encounters are experienced. It should be mentioned that the number of pre-built encounters can go a long way to making each encounter feel fresh, such as in Into the Breach, which managed to fool me into thinking its levels were procedurally generated, even though it actually just utilizes about 200 handcrafted levels that enemies are randomly placed into. However, these encounter-based roguelikes are still roguelikes, as their large-scale maps and zoomed-in encounters both utilize procedural systems to generate a completely unique experience for each run, and for those reasons, I feel these encounter-based games should count as roguelikes. The other essential element of roguelikes is permadeath, which describes a system where, if the player triggers a fail state, they must restart the game with none of their progress transferring to the next run. I remember when I was a kid and I first learned about roguelikes by watching my older cousins play games such as Dungeon Crawl, Stone Soup, and FTL. When I first heard about permadeath, I was a bit confused. To my child mind, permadeath seemed extremely unfair. Why would anyone want to play a game that would take away all of your progress if you died? In the summer of 2017, I played Spelunky, and it was the first roguelike to really dig its hooks into me. Within a few minutes of booting up the game, I found myself staring at the game over screen. Pathetically, I had failed to clear even a single level, but I kept trying again and again. Even though I was continually dying, the more time I spent with Spelunky, the more I understood the purpose of permadeath. Permadeath is all about consequence. Because saving and reloading aren't options, the player is forced to commit to their actions. The stakes are extremely high in games with permadeath, because any mistake can bring your run crumbling down, but these high stakes are what makes roguelikes so compelling. Oftentimes, I have found that roguelikes are a genre that are great at making choices meaningful, and I think a large part of that can be traced back to the fact that choices feel the most meaningful when they have meaningful impact on the future game state. Because of permadeath, Choices have a significant impact on the future because if the player makes enough bad choices, their run will permanently come to an end. Conversely, if the player makes enough good choices, they will win the game. Seeing the results of your actions is very important for a roguelike's design. In his book on the development of Spelunky, Derek Yu explains, I wanted the player to make difficult decisions and experience both the satisfaction of choosing correctly and the regret of choosing poorly. It is the permanence of their actions that allows the player to feel the emotions of their decisions. If players could reload the world and try again, it would undermine a lot of the consequence these games are trying to provide. 
As Rogue developer Glenn Wickman explains, if I can save the game and then drink the potion and, oh, it's bad, then I restore the game and I don't drink the potion. That entire gameplay mechanic just completely goes away. So that was the whole reason why, once you have taken an action and a consequence has happened, there is no way to undo it. Permadeath, while intense, elevates the significance of your choices by forcing you to face the consequences those choices spawned, for good or ill. Additionally, the importance of procedural generation in the creation of tension cannot be overlooked. As I mentioned in my tension video, Tension is created when the players have enough information to formulate questions, but not enough to fully answer them, resulting in a situation where the player is left in anticipation of a resolution to those questions. The tension the player feels will also be influenced by the stakes associated with those questions. Permadeath is extremely good at creating tension because it dramatically raises the stakes. The player only gets one shot at each seed, and if the player makes just a few too many bad plays, all of their progress is undone, which presumably the player doesn't want to happen. By the end of many roguelikes, my heart is beating as I try to close out these insane death gauntlets with a victory. While I feel that permadeath is quite a compelling system, it is quite intimidating for new players. In an attempt to make the genre more approachable, some developers have removed permadeath from their games in favor of a system that, while sending the player back to the start of the game, allows players to permanently increase the power levels of their character. Notable examples of this sort of system are games like Rogue Legacy or Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. While they still have some element of permadeath, I feel that they don't fully meet the definition of permadeath, which requires a clean slate upon death. Because permadeath is such an important part of the genre, I would not call these games roguelikes. Instead, I would refer to games that feature procedural content generation and a permadeath system that allows for permanent progress as roguelites. Roguelites themselves are an extremely complex topic, and if you want to hear more about their design, Game Maker's Toolkit has an excellent video discussing roguelite progression in comparison to roguelikes and the effects that this has on their design. Some people bring up games where the player can unlock new items that are added to an item pool and can be encountered on future runs, claiming that these games don't feature true permadeath. This argument is also applied to games that have unlockable characters that could be used for future runs. The thing about unlockable equipment is that it doesn't actually make the player more powerful from the start of the game. When a player dies in a roguelike with unlockable equipment, they are always reverted to the same basic character differentiating them from the roguelites, where that basic character is gradually increasing in power. In other words, the games with unlockable items will always return the player to the clean slate, while the roguelites do not. Instead, there are just more items that can potentially be encountered, and theoretically all of these items are going to be roughly equivalent to each other, and even if there are some unlockable items that make the game significantly easier, I still believe these games should be considered roguelikes. In the case of unlockable characters, a similar principle applies. It could easily be the case where one character is easier than the others. However, once again, the power level of any individual character doesn't increase from run to run. The purpose of multiple characters in a roguelike is to provide variety of playstyles. Even if an alternate character is significantly more or less powerful than another, unlocking a character is less about permanently upgrading a character and is perhaps closer to a difficulty selection option, which in my opinion does not undermine these games' status as a roguelike. When combined, procedural generation and permadeath harmoniously feed into each other, making the other element more compelling. The endless supply of new levels keeps the game fresh, as the permadeath continually sends the player back to the start. The threat of permadeath makes the game more intense, as the player holds on to the randomized upgrades, knowing that if they die they might not find this combination of items for a while. The combination of procedural generation and permadeath is iconic, and over the decades, thousands of games have iterated on mechanics within these systems. That is why I feel that procedural generation and permadeath are definitional to the genre. However, not everyone agrees with my definition, claiming that permadeath and procedural generation alone do not make a game enough like Rogue. Instead, these people refer to roguelikes that aren't top-down dungeon crawlers as roguelites, or more sillily, 
roguelike likes, as if roguelike wasn't already complicated enough. While I disagree with this viewpoint, if I don't address these people's concern, the comments will be filled with people claiming that my entire video is invalid. A proper explanation of their argument and why I find it uncompelling requires a bit more historical context. After Rogue was released, it was extremely popular, especially in college campuses. Before long, avid Rogue fans were creating their own games inspired by Rogue, such as Hack and Moria. One cool thing about these early roguelikes was that most of them were open source community projects that released their source code, allowing anyone to make alterations to the game, or even fork the code to use as foundation to create an entirely new game. As a result, there were all sorts of roguelikes coming out across many different roguelike families. However, all of these games were mostly similar to the original Rogue, in the sense that they were top-down turn-based dungeon crawlers. These games even aesthetically looked very similar, because most of them retained the ASCII aesthetic, even past the point where it was technologically obsolete, though some did eventually switch to graphical tilesets. In 2008, a group of roguelike developers attending the International Roguelike Development Conference in Berlin attempted to define what a roguelike even was. Their proposal is referred to as the Berlin Interpretation, and this would eventually become the roguelike community's most accepted definition. However, I have a long list of problems with this definition, but before getting into those, I want to establish what the Berlin Interpretation even says before tearing it apart. When creating their interpretation, the drafters declared that Rogue, NetHack, Angband, Crawl, and Ancient Domains of Mystery were to be the canon roguelikes, and from these games they selected a set of 9 high value factors and 6 low value factors that these games shared. These are the values that the drafters selected, presented in their own words. Random Environment Generation The game world is randomly generated in a way that increases replayability. Appearance and placement of items is random. Appearance of monsters is fixed, their placement is random. Fixed content, plots or puzzles or vaults, removes randomness. Permadeath. You are not expected to win the game with your first character. You start over from the first level when you die. It is possible to save games, but the save file is deleted upon reloading. The random environment makes this enjoyable rather than punishing. Turn-based. Each command corresponds to a single action slash movement. The game is not sensitive to time, and you can take your time to choose your action. Grid-based. The world is represented by a uniform grid of tiles. Monsters and the player take up one tile, regardless of size. Non-modal. Movement, battle, and other actions take place in the same mode. Every action should be available at any point in the game. Violations to this are Ancient Domains of Mysteries Overworld, or Angband and Crawl's Shops. Complexity. The game has enough complexity to allow several solutions to common goals. This is obtained by providing enough item slash monster and item slash item interactions, and is strongly connected to having just one mode. Resource Management. You have to manage your limited resource, e.g. food, healing potions and find uses for the resources you receive. Hack and Slash Even though there can be much more to the game, killing lots of monsters is a very important part of a roguelike. The game is player versus world. There are no monster-on-monster -monster relations, like enmities or diplomacy. Exploration and Discovery The game requires careful exploration of the dungeon levels, and discovery of the usage of unidentified items. This has to be done anew every time the player starts a new game. Those were all of the high value factors. The remaining elements are the low value factors. Single player character. The player controls a single character. The game is player centric. The world is viewed through that one character and that character's death is the end of the game. Monsters are similar to players. Rules that apply to the player apply to monsters as well. They have inventories, equipment, can use items, cast spells, etc. Tactical Challenge You have to learn about the tactics before you can make any significant progress. This process repeats itself, i.e. early game knowledge is not enough to beat the late game. Due to random environments and permanent death, roguelikes are challenging to new players. 
The game's focus is on providing tactical challenges, as opposed to strategically working on the big picture or solving puzzles. ASCII Display The traditional display for roguelikes is to represent the tiled world by ASCII characters. As a quick side note for those who might not be familiar, ASCII characters are the symbols that one would find on a keyboard. Essentially, ASCII graphics are made using letters and other elements one might find on a keyboard. Dungeons Roguelikes contain dungeons, such as levels composed of rooms and corridors. Numbers The numbers used to describe the character, hit points, attributes, etc., are deliberately shown. These are the elements of the Berlin interpretation. Now that we know what it is, I'm going to define a few terms that will make this section less repetitive. Anytime I refer to a Berlin roguelike, I'm talking about games that closely follow the Berlin interpretation. The counterpart to Berlin roguelikes are neo-roguelikes, which are games that have procedural generation and permadeath without necessarily having other elements of the Berlin interpretation. With these definitions out of the way, I can explain my problems with the Berlin interpretation as a definition of the genre. Firstly, as a definition, it's extraordinarily fuzzy and inconsistent about what a roguelike really is. In the preamble, the drafters mention that missing some points doesn't exclude a game from being a roguelike, and possessing some points doesn't make a game a roguelike. However, the drafters never specify how many of the points are needed before a game becomes a true roguelike. Spelunky, for instance, has seven of the nine high-value factors of a roguelike. Seemingly, because it meets most of the definition, it should be considered a proper roguelike. However, most of the people who use the Berlin interpretation would claim that Spelunky is not a true roguelike. Because the interpretation is extremely vague about how many of the values a game must possess before it becomes a roguelike, it becomes significantly less useful in determining if a game does or does not count as a roguelike. I could say that 7 values is enough to count, but someone else could say that's not enough, so we're no closer to definitely figuring out if Spelunky or any other neo-roguelike is a roguelike under the Berlin interpretation. In addition to the large-scale fuzziness of the interpretation, many of the individual factors are also vague and imprecise. Specifically, I feel that complexity, resource management, exploration and discovery, and hack and slash aren't very clear-cut. How much complexity does a game need before it satisfies this factor? What about resource management or hack and slash? Ultimately, the problem with these factors as definitional elements is that they are non-binary factors. To understand what I mean by this, compare it to binary elements like procedural generation. A game either has procedural generation, or it doesn't. These non-binary factors, on the other hand, aren't a simple yes-no question. Instead, it's a question of how much of these elements a particular game has. Every game to some extent has complexity. Some only have a little, some have a lot. And some are in between. Once again, determining if a game meets these non-binary factors is extremely subjective. I might say that FTL has enough complexity to meet the complexity requirement, but someone else could argue that it doesn't, further increasing the fuzziness and unspecificity of this definition. Additionally, I find the distinction between high and low value factors to be quite odd, because once again, it's hard to say how important the interpretation considers these elements are for determining if a game is a roguelike. ASCII graphics are included as part of the interpretation, however today, all of the five canon roguelikes have graphical modes that completely remove this element, and most people would still say that the graphical versions of these games still count as roguelikes casting the ultimate importance of ASCII graphics into question. Roguelike developer Darren Gray certainly doesn't think that ASCII is important to defining roguelikes. In a blog post titled Screw the Interpretation, adding ASCII to your game does not in any way make it more roguelike. Taking ASCII away does not make it any less roguelike. It's absurd to place value on this beyond an aesthetic choice. It's like saying platformers have to have pixel graphics because all the old platformers had pixel graphics. Gray makes a great point here that we shouldn't tie a genre's definition to certain elements purely because the older games in the genre did it. When looking at most of these factors, I find myself asking how important they are to the spirit that Rogue pioneered. 
Almost every element of the interpretation can exist in other genres, without necessarily evoking rogue. However, when combining permadeath and procedural generation, rogue will always be evoked to some extent, as evidenced by the fact that the neo-roguelikes will still be referred to as roguelites, even by the most hardcore Berlin interpretation supporters. Even if they don't admit that these are fully like rogue, the label of roguelite implies that they still feel there is a connection between these games and the canon roguelikes. None of the other elements in the Berlin interpretation are able to evoke rogue as strongly as permadeath and procedural generation. There are all sorts of turn-based games on grids that don't feel like roguelikes. There are tons of complex games about resource management that don't feel like roguelikes. There are all sorts of explorative hack and slashes that don't feel like roguelikes. No other combination gets a special label to describe what they are. They are just accepted to be in different genres entirely. My point is, procedural generation and permadeath have always been the linchpin that differentiates roguelikes from every other genre. That's why I focused so much on these elements in the first half of this video, and it's why I find the interpretation so uncompelling. The Berlin interpretation includes a bunch of extraneous elements that, while commonly found in early roguelikes, aren't what differentiates the genre from any other genre. Perhaps the greatest failing of the Berlin interpretation is that, through its canonization of five games, it hasn't been able to keep up with the changes the genre has undergone. Shortly after the Berlin interpretation was drafted, Spelunky was released on the TIG Source forums, changing the world of roguelikes forever. What made Spelunky so unique was that it was one of the first roguelikes to utilize permadeath and procedural generation in a genre that typically did not feature those mechanics. In many ways, Spelunky is the Martin Luther of roguelikes. Spelunky fundamentally changed how people thought about and categorized roguelikes, but the Berlin interpretation was too stiff to allow for that change in thinking. Because Spelunky no longer resembled the five canon roguelikes, the Berlin interpretation could no longer describe the entire rogue landscape. Some would argue that this means Spelunky can't be a roguelike, while others, such as myself, argue that it revealed what connected these games together was a lot deeper than the surface level elements proposed by the Berlin interpretation. Instead of needlessly clinging to top-down dungeon crawling, Spelunky understood that those elements weren't what made these games special. For these reasons, I find the Berlin interpretation as a definition of a genre pretty useless. Genre can serve many purposes, but one of its primary purposes is to inform the consumer about the sorts of mechanics and experiences that can be expected from any given title. For instance, when a game is described as a real-time strategy game, a consumer can rightfully expect a strategy experience that takes place in real time. Genre can even be used to describe more experiential traits. A horror game promises an experience that is in some way scary or horrific. The divide in what the roguelike community considers to be a roguelike comes down to a disagreement about the promise being made to consumers when a game is being described as a roguelike. To some people, the roguelike description promises a turn-based dungeon crawling experience, and to others, roguelike simply describes games with permadeath and procedural generation. One reason commonly cited for why a roguelike must include dungeon crawling elements is that the original rogue was a pure roguelike, and later attempts to branch these sorts of games into other genres diluted that pure core. Neo-roguelikes are commonly referred to as hybrid roguelikes because they combine elements from roguelikes with other genres, such as platformers or shooters. In other words, this isn't a roguelike, it's a platformer with roguelike characteristics. However, I find this argument uncompelling, largely because it could be argued that roguelike characteristics have always been accessory to other genres. Essentially, even Rogue was a hybrid dungeon crawler. After all, dungeon crawlers are their own fruitful genre completely capable of existing without permadeath and procedural generation. In many ways, Rogue was seeking to emulate the dungeon crawling elements of Dungeons & Dragons, but it was differentiated from earlier roguelikes by its inclusion of permadeath and procedural generation. The difference between a normal dungeon crawling experience and a roguelike largely depends on if the game has permadeath 
and procedural generation, implying that these elements are the special sauce that makes a game roguelike, more so than the turn-based gameplay or ASCII aesthetic, or anything else in the Berlin interpretation. Essentially, Rogue and its descendants did the exact same thing to dungeon crawlers as later roguelikes would do to other genres. Unfortunately, while the hybrid dungeon crawler roguelikes are accepted readily by all roguelike fans, many still refuse to do the same for the neo roguelikes. On the one hand, it's hard to blame people for conflating roguelikes with the older style. After all, for over 20 years, roguelikes purely existed as dungeon crawlers, which conditioned people to see roguelikes as purely being dungeon crawlers. However, that doesn't change the idea that what made these dungeon crawlers distinct from any other dungeon crawler was their permadeath and procedural generation, and that these elements could just as easily be grafted onto other sorts of gameplay, and still retain the spirit those elements evoke. First-person shooters make a good comparison to roguelikes, because they also can draw their lineage back to a single game that was the template for much of the genre's early development. As you probably know, first-person shooters weren't always called first-person shooters. Instead, they were called Doom clones, in reference to the fact that many early shooters bore a striking resemblance to Doom. However, Eventually, Doom clones started to become less formulaic, and it became clear that these games could express a wide range of ideas and design philosophies. Some focused on rich narrative experiences that involved guns. Milsons focused on accurately depicting real guns to an almost simulationist level. Some are arcade-style experiences about chasing high scores. Others don't even focus on shooting enemies, choosing instead to offer cerebral puzzle experiences. Some forego single-player content to focus on huge multiplayer battles, while some challenge players to work together to overcome a common enemy. There are even a few that take cues from these old roguelike games to create some really intense first-person death gauntlets. However, despite how radically different all of these games are, people recognize that they all share the same core idea of shooting things from a first-person perspective, and that this idea could go beyond simply shooting demons in a corridor. That's why the shooter community moved past calling these Doom clones, and they earned their modern title, First Person Shooters. However, this realization never fully happened for roguelikes, and to this day you will find people arguing that if a game wants to be called a roguelike, it MUST adhere to the elements of the canon roguelikes, all the way down to the most minute, meaningless details, such as the fact that these games had ASCII graphics and numbers. I feel that the Berlin interpretation promotes a vision of roguelikes that is extremely narrow-minded, that doesn't allow for the extremely varied reinterpretation of core ideas that can be found in any other genre. Fortunately, many developers just stopped caring about the Berlin interpretation's limiting view of roguelikes, and I feel the genre is in a much more interesting place for it. While the neo-roguelikes don't focus on copying the surface-level aspects of Rogue, they do the much more important thing of understanding, preserving, and recreating the spirit and intent behind Rogue, bringing its core ideas to all sorts of crazy places. Procedural generation and permadeath have an extremely iconic and rich relationship that defines how these games feel to play, more so than any other elements commonly included as foundational to the roguelike experience. In my opinion, that's what makes these games like Rogue. They're like Rogue in all the ways that matter. Unfortunately, we're past the point where the roguelike community could realistically change their name in the same way that the Doom clones were able to. However, we can still decide what exactly it means to be a roguelike. Personally, I feel these games are characterized by their permadeath and procedural generation, because those elements have great potential to promote rich and compelling gameplay. Hopefully, this video was able to teach someone something. At the very least, I think both the neo-roguelike and Berlin roguelike styles have something unique to offer, and I recommend games from both styles. At the end of the day, I doubt this video will solve the what is a roguelike debate. However, I do think there is at least one thing all roguelike fans can agree upon. No matter what you want to call them, Berlin roguelikes do some pretty unique things, and the neo-roguelikes have innovated to create all sorts of interesting experiences. 
These are worlds of infinite possibility, unlike anything else available, where chaos and uncertainty reign supreme. Ultimately, I think that open-ended beauty of Rogue has transcended such things as turn-based dungeon crawling. It's a beauty that can materialize in everything, from the twitchiest action roguelike to the slowest contemplative dungeon crawler. So what is a roguelike? To me, it's that beautiful merger of procedural generation and permadeath that has proved compelling enough to survive and thrive decades into the future, and I think that speaks to how exceptional of an idea roguelikes really are. There's obviously so much more to unpack about roguelike design, but that might have to wait for another day. Until then, this has been Chariot Rider. Have a good day.